praise for your faithfulness. Amazing, Lord, how far you have come. We're grateful for all you have done for us time and again. Year after year, the miracles, great and small to have come through again and again we want to say thank you Lord thank you for sunshine of rain wholeheartedly thank you Lord thank you we'll say it again And welcome to IES online service. My name is Tirza and I'm the digital pastor here at IES and I want to welcome all of you to our service today. 
especially if this is your first time or second time or third time or you're checking out our online service we would love to get to know you and tell you a little bit about IES and IES online ministries so there will be a QR code on the screen uh, and a link in the chat for you to click on and just fill out that simple form and we will get back to you and share you a little bit about IES. Well, friends, this weekend uh, we have a lot of things to just expect from the Lord. And so let us join service together. Hello, hello. Welcome to IES. My name is Patty. I almost said teacher Patty because I'm from Kids Church and I usually introduce myself as Teacher Patty. I am so glad to be here to welcome you all. I want to welcome those of you who are here and those of you who are tuning in online. Welcome to IES. If this is your first time here or maybe this is the first time you've been back for a long time, we want to connect with you. IES is one big family, so we want you to be a part of that family. We have some pastoral staff or some staff here in the front, so after the service, come meet with us and connect with us. We'd love to get to know you. Um, we're about to start our service, but before we do that, let me open us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we, we just thank you. We, we praise you for your faithfulness, for loving us despite all of our faults. We thank you. We pray, Lord, today that you would be here as we worship you, as we listen to your word. We pray that you will soften our hearts, that we may be sensitive to your word and to your leading, Lord. We thank you today, tomorrow, and every day. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Would you all stand and let's worship the Lord this evening. everybody come all you weary come all you thirsty come to the well that never runs dry a drink of the water come and thirst no more yeah. come all you sinners come find his mercy take the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for sing it with me for god so loved the world that he gave us his water and all his son to save us to
I don't have to sing it like an angel I can come to you with confidence It's easier than I've made it We don't have to act like perfect people To get an invitation to your table It's easier than we've made it So much easier than we've made it And all that you want is my attention God, if that is my cost You can have my forever I'll be finding a billion ways to show you to show you just, just how much I love you as I do I could turn my car into a road We could turn this room into a church It's easier than we made it I won't save my worship for a Sunday this life without you is more than just a song It's easier than we've made It's so much easier than we've made Sing it with me And all that you want is my attention God in fact my cost You can have my forever sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever sing I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of
show you a million ways to show you sing again I could sing over your left forever let's worship the Lord I could sing of your love forever yes. I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love forever I could sing of your love sing it to the Lord I could sing of your love forever. 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 As we go to the Lord this evening, we want to lift up in prayer. Uh, the Satterfield family, I, I, I just received news. Some of you know David and Jerry Satterfield. They were here over a period of years. They were here a lot. They usually were in Katawachi and staying with their daughter and son-in-law, John and Jason Myers. And he, he did a lot of life group ministry. He preached in IES. He famously preached a message that he talked about how God doesn't keep track of our sins and inspired Pastor Misha to write that song, You Don't Remind Me of Your Sin. Uh, Jerry, the wife, went to be with the Lord just a few hours ago. And so we need to pray for the Satterfield family. We just lift them up to the Lord and strengthen them. About a month ago, they discovered that she had a very serious and quickly uh, damaging disease. And so they've been preparing this last month. And we want to pray for them and that the Lord would comfort them and be with them. We want to pray for the needs that we have as a congregation. And we've prayed a lot before the election. Now we're going to pray after the election. Because, you know, a lot of times when I do premarital counseling with a couple, I look at them and I think, yeah, you just don't get it, what it's going to really be like. And so I always tell them, we do postmarital counseling too. And often they need that more than they needed the premarital counseling. And we've had pre-election prayer. Now we have post-election prayer that, we, that God will continue to work and be with Indonesia. We want to pray for the needs that we have as a congregation. So if you're here and you have a need, just lift your hand and say, God, do something in my life. You know what it is. You may not know what it is that you need God to do, but you know there's something. And then those of you who can look and see who have her hand is raised, if they're nearby you, you might want to go and gather around them or look at somebody and just feel like the Lord's asking you to pray for them. Let's go to the Lord together. Father, we lift up our needs before you, Lord. Not only those of us who are here, but those who are in the online service. They can click on that. I have a prayer need. They can click on that, and we pray for them as well, Lord. And all through the services that we have that will be online, Lord. We pray for all of those needs. And we pray for the people who are here. We thank you, Lord, because we do not need to overwhelm you with information about our needs. You know the needs that we have. And yet you ask us to ask you. And so we obey you by asking. We are confident that in asking, Lord, that you hear our prayers and answer our prayers. And because we have been obedient to you, we know that we've done the part that you have called us. This is also a form of our love to you, Lord, that we call upon you. You are the only God who hears and can meet all of our needs, Lord. And we are confident in the future that we have with you, Lord, for we don't always understand why some needs are met and some needs don't seem to be answered. And yet we know that you have the best solution. And so we pray one for another. Meet every need of everyone who is here and everyone who is watching this service, Lord, even in the days to come as people watch it online, Lord meet every single need that they have. Father, we lift up the Satterfield family. They're uh, uh, not only David, but loss of his wife of, of so many years, but also, Lord, their children, their grandchildren, Lord. We pray that you would comfort all of them, Lord, and we lift them to you. And Father, we lift up Indonesia to you, Lord. We thank you that we have been able to lift up this country before the election. We have confidence. You have heard our prayers, Lord, that the, the election went peacefully. And, and we are confident, Lord, that your plan and purpose will be unfolded in this country. And so we pray that you would continue to have your country, your hands on this country, Lord. 
We pray that you would fulfill in every aspect your plan and purpose through the lives, Lord, of, of this country and the influence that this country has. And especially, Lord, again, our prayer is always for the people who are in this country who are call upon your name, Lord. Even if they identify themselves as Christians and yet they don't seem to live as Christians, Lord, let your Holy Spirit speak to their hearts and draw them close to you, Lord, that the people of God in this country may be close to you, listen to you, and follow you. And may your plan and purpose for Indonesia and all of the countries around us, Lord, be fulfilled through the work of the believers. We thank you and praise you for all of these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. And good evening to all of you. It's, it's great to see you all here, and I want to just welcome you. And uh, I was just thinking about that when I was watching that video. I was thinking about asking myself, examining myself, and asking myself, all right, were there ways in which I was generous? Uh, looking back on this week and the way I added, treated other people and different things like that. And Because if, if I expect the Lord to be generous to me, and I know he will be generous to me, the capacity by which I receive generosity depends on how I was myself generous. I'm thinking, yeah, I could probably do better. So anyway, it's good, to, it's good to talk to all of you, especially for the people here online. It's great to have a chance to talk to you about it. And I want to just invite everybody to take out your phone and go ahead and open up your phone and uh, go to the Church Center app. Uh, I looked at the numbers, and you guys have responded well to signing in. It's great. It will give us an opportunity to uh, be able to work with the data that we have a little bit in a way that we'd want to. So go to Church Center app. Go to check-in. If, if you haven't downloaded the Church Center app, please talk to somebody after the service. They can help you with that. And the Church Center app, I'm going to, baby, if you don't mind, I'll check you in as well. And we check in for the main auditorium. If you're online and you're doing it at this very moment, check in for the 5 o'clock service. And if you're going to be doing it at some later point, please do check in. But I'm not sure how that works. So we'll figure all of that out. Now, you remember last week we did a really brief demographic service to try and find out some details about the people that go to IAS. Uh, it was kind of a, a low weekend. And so uh, we only got out of our, all the adults that go, we got 466 results. But that's a huge sample size compared to everything else. And I thought you might find some of this information interesting. So let me just tell you how this goes. First of all, I want to share with you about the demographic issue of what the people, uh, family information. Uh, of the people that go to IES, 51.4% of the people that come to IES come with their kids, uh, married with kids. Of uh, the singles, 27% are single, which is actually higher, a little bit higher than I expected. This service, it's much, much less. And so um, married with adult kids is 13.6%, and then married with no kids is 8%. And so that's kind of interesting. And then the educational level. I, I found this quite fascinating. The people who go to IES, uh, the SATU degree, the, the bachelor degree, 53.7% have a bachelor's degree, 31% have an SDUA, a master's degree or equivalent, which is higher than it was uh, about 12 years ago, last time we did the educational aspect in UOB. I'm, I don't know why people that come here are more educated than people that go there. I'm just assuming that some of you in the last uh, 12 years did your master's degree, and, uh, and we'll figure out that. 73% had a, what we'd call an STG or some kind of a doctorate. I, I'm sorry, 1.7%. And then an associate of arts or a DATIGA, Degree, 7.3%. 4.7% only finished high school, and one person only finished middle school. I don't think we actually had an option for no school at all. When we were in IS, we did actually have somebody who was a part of the church but had never attended school and, and have found that kind of an interesting journey because we all know there are other ways to be educated other than in school, and we respect that as well. Uh, as we do a few more demographic studies and as we do, a, I'll share this information with you. I just find it kind of interesting. And please understand, that's a composite 
I, maybe what I should do is I should look through uh, and I should report to the services according to the information because I know like this service is much more heavily married people than it is singles and then one of the other services had a lot more single people. So anyway, uh, would you all stand to your feet? We're going to read a passage of scripture. Following the theme of our worship time, we're going to be talking about God's love and we're going to be talking about one of the most amazing passages that talks about his love. Let's read together out loud. We will begin this part of our service and end this part of our service by reading this wonderful passage. 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Please read together out loud with me. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. But the people who, don't, who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. Let's pray. Father, be with us in this service as we look at your word and as we try and understand how much you love us, what does this do for us, what does this imply, what, how does this change us, and what we need to do as a result of your great love. We pray all these things together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. I'm not going to make you do soap tonight. So I know some of you looked around. You didn't want to sit too close by somebody who looked a, a little. I was going to ask you, Pastor Anthony, did you guys do the demographic survey? We weren't sure if you guys did. Okay. So that's where all the single people came from for the encounter. All right. So we were wondering about that. All right. Let's just take a look at this beautiful, beautiful passage of Scripture. Um, this is one of the early passages that I used. When you're, when you're a preacher, you need to prepare sermons that you need to give on kind of a moment's notice. So uh, you're going through something and somebody says, hey, can you come to our church on Tuesday and preach? And you have to be ready for that. And this, was, this information was one of the first pieces of text I worked with um, 40 plus years ago to be prepared. So uh, don't worry, I'm not borrowing a 40-year-old sermon, but I wanted to go back to this text. Okay, let's take a look at this. The first thing that we see in this is that we're shown how much he loves us by the fact that he calls us his children. We're shown how much he loves us by the fact that he calls us his children. Now, in a, in a Roman, in a Mediterranean-based culture, in the Roman world in those days, to, uh, to bring somebody into your family and to make them part of your family was something that was understood, what you and I would call adoption. In our modern world today, adoption is somewhat kind of an interesting thing, and we talk about somebody having the same the same uh, blood or the same family line, and, and they really didn't feel that way. An adopted person was just as much a part of the family as somebody who was, and, and often somebody who was born into a family but was never acknowledged as being a child of that family was never considered a part of that family. It was the family, not the blood lineage, that was a really important question. And we see here is that the Father has shown his love for us in this by the fact that he calls us his children. For those of you and I who have children, we look at our children and we speak to them, we call them children, we identify them as our children, we brag about them being on our children, and part of that is an expression of love. Now you and I know that that's not the only way that God shows us his love. It's an important way and that's the way we're going to talk about. But it would be wrong for us to go through this without acknowledging an equally important scripture in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and it says there, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And that's what this whole picture is. We become his children because Christ died for us. God extended himself. God, uh, God opened up his family. God opened up his heart to us and drew us in while we were still far from him. There's nothing that we ever did. And so he called us his children. Now, what does that mean? What are the parts of being his, ch his children, his child, that come along? Well, some of them I think about is that it's a sense of belonging. We have a sense of belonging because he calls us children. And Jesus talked to his disciples and he said, I now call you friends. And God calls us sons and daughters. 
And that gives us a full sense of belonging. An understanding that because we belong to him and we're his family, we are part of something bigger than us. I, I thought about this a lot when I prepared this particular point because I, for me it expresses something about my own feeling about being a part of IES. You know, people talk about having a sense of purpose. And I recognize that for me in my life, a great deal of my sense of purpose is fulfilled in and in, in my, my marriage, my wife and I, we're not only committed to each other, we're committed to living our lives in a certain way. And, and as we raised our daughter, we, we, and I, I'm not going to mention her name because every time I mention her name, I have to send her $5, so I'm not going to mention my daughter's name. But, but we're committed as a family to fulfilling God's purpose in a certain way. And, and that also comes very heavily from my, the, the family background that, that we have. However, I also realize, if you ask me about my sense of purpose... My sense of purpose in life is, in a large way, fulfilled by being a part of IES. And perhaps maybe that's why I'm so serious about what we are as a church. Because I believe that God has uniquely called us together, not uniquely in the sense that we're better than any other church. I don't actually feel that at all. But he has a unique purpose in us, and that purpose is being fulfilled in like you saw the, the, the thing on the, uh, on the upcoming build. I've seen the pictures they were sent to me of the six families that got houses that were built by IES. For those of you who went for the, for, for the Habitat for Humanity build, those six houses were finished and six families have moved into that house. I've seen the picture of the family standing in front of their old house and they were smiling or they were trying to smile and I've seen the fi- picture of the family standing in front of their new house belongs to them built by IES, and they've got a big smile on their face. And believe me, it's a much nicer house. It's a much better house. That's a part of my fulfillment. I didn't go. I didn't join. I'm not much help on a work site. In fact, when I, when I go to something like that, they, they waste more energy making me happy or keeping, taking care of me. You know, Don't walk over there, Pastor Dave, because you know, it's rough. Or, oh, you better just sit down over there and stay out of the way, Pastor Dave. They don't say stay out of the way, but that's what they really mean. But the sense of having a sense of purpose. I'm so excited that we're going to go again in the next time. And the next time we want to have 100 people go so we can finish 10 houses. And that would be phenomenal. And the IES men is going to organize not only the IES men, but the, the, uh, the men from Klapagating and the men from Pick and the men from West and the men from Northwest. And they're going to have a bill like that. Our sense of fulfillment and purpose comes from being a part of the family of God and being his children. We are no longer drifters. We're no longer wondering what this is all about. We're no longer wondering what is my purpose in life. My purpose in life is to be his child and to be engaged in what he's doing. Secondly, it's not just a sense of belonging. It's a sense of care. God cares for us. The one who knows everything guides us. Isn't that like cheating? Yeah? The one who knows what's going to happen tells us what to do next. You know, you, you've seen all the modern-day uh, uh, spy movies and stuff, and, and it's completely fabricated, you know, as the guy gets ready to go, and he goes, ding, like this, and you know he's supposed to be putting some kind of thing in his ear, and then as he walks through, he says, which way are they going? Turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right, and he catches the guy he's supposed to catch. Yeah, that's fantasy. What we have is reality. The one who leads us is the one who knows the future. And I'll tell you what, we were talking about this the other day, and, you know, uh, in the early days of IES, I, I used to tell a lot of blonde jokes, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and I, I better not tell a blonde joke, but I would, you know, this looks like a safe crowd. I could probably get away with it, but I, but I, but I, I you know, and I, and I thought it was funny. Everybody thought it was funny. And then one day I was talking to somebody in the church that was blonde, and um, I thought they would think it was funny. And they said, you know, Pastor Dave, I just have such a hard time in my life with so many things happening. And then I go to church and you make fun of me. No more blonde jokes, right? And then I used to tell lawyer jokes. I used to tell a lot of lawyer jokes. And I know lawyers who tell lawyer jokes, so I thought it was safe. And then one of our lawyers in IES, there was an incident in another part of the city, and a group of people had been coming uh, to speak up about something that they were really opposed to. And that, the lawyer from our church went there and stood in a street and blocked a mob that were going to do something bad with his own body. And he stood out in the street. I thought, man, I, I can't make fun of lawyers anymore because uh, you know, that's something really good. So I'm not going to tell you anything more about this story, but let me tell you about a story, all right? It's a group of people that lived down in the Antarctic. 
And they're way down there. It's in the wintertime. Things are really bad. You know, there's no way to get in and out and everything else. And, of course, they're representatives from many nations. And everybody there loves football, like real football, not American football, real football. And they're all fans from all these different countries. And, and the thing that happens is because the communication is really, really bad, during the time the games are actually played, which is usually like 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, there's a broadcast, but it's not a broadcast of the video. It's just a really bad play-by-play -play announcement of the game. But then over the time when things get better, they ship the video in, and later on in the evening, they're all able to watch the game together. And so some people watch it, and they're able to understand what happened, but they, you know, the details aren't really there. And then later that evening, they all watch it together. And so this one guy thought, you know what? Not, not everybody listens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen to the game. And, and he listens to the game. And, and then he's talking to another guy, another guy from another country. I will say that the first guy is, is British. I won't say where the second guy is from. And the British guy, and they're talking. And, uh, and, and the other guy, the British guy says, wow, you know, it'll be an interesting match. We'll have fun watching it together because your country and my country are playing in the game this evening. And the guy says, yeah, I think my, my country will win. Well, he knows they lost. And so he says to the guy, let's bet 50 pounds on who wins the game. I'll bet you 50 pounds my country wins. You bet 50 pounds your country wins. The guy says, sure. And of course, the game is played. And he already knew his team was going to win, right? So it was a sucker's bet. And he kind of feels bad. And so he tells the other guy, oh, I, he said, I'm sorry. I have to admit to you, I listened to the radio broadcast. I already knew who was going to win. It wasn't fair. And the guy said, I listened to the radio broadcast too. I just couldn't believe they would lose twice in the same day. <laughs> so anyway, we have the comfort of knowing that the one who knows the future is the one who's directing us and guiding us. It's, it's a sucker's bet in life. We know how the end works out. And thirdly, the fact that we're children of God gives us a, not just a sense of belonging, not just a sense of care, but it gives us a sense of purpose. I, I, a few years ago, my brother-in-law retired, and I asked him, how did he find retirement? And he said, it's very interesting because I have, I have I, 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 many things are good, but I miss being a part of a team and working together to accomplish goals. And I, I didn't mention his name, so I don't have to give him $5, but I think that's one of the things that's wonderful about that sense of purpose that we have. We're his children. And whenever his children anywhere in this country or in this world or in this country or in this city do something good, we rejoice in it because it gives us a sense of purpose. We know how it's going to end. We know what's going to happen in the end. We know what we're wanting to do. And we have confidence and we have rejoicing because we have a sense of purpose. Now let's go on to talk about this thing. The next thing that we want to talk about is that we really are his children. Now, you and I understand almost everybody. This is one of the advantages we have. I always tell you we have advantages when we talk to teenagers and younger because they all know multiverse, so it's easy for us to talk about multiple futures and God, the way God says, if you do this, this happens. If you do this, this happens, and, and so on. Well, the fact that you speak more than one language makes it easier to talk about translation because you guys all know that some words are word for word in another language, but many aren't. And so it's often hard to express things in one language. That's why you need to, when you read the Bible, you should read from several different translations. Because some translations choose to emphasize one thing. Some translations choose to emphasize one other nuance or possibility. And, and some will, of course, kind of sprinkle a whole bunch of them together. And this is why I'm going to do what I did. It says in here, we really are his children. In the NIV version, it says, and that's what we really are. In the message version, it says, and that's who we really are. In the New Testament, for everyone, it said, and that indeed is what we are. That statement there is we really are God's children. It's not just a label. The business of fake labels, of fake names on bags, on watches, on clothes, and all that kind of stuff, is a huge business in the world. And the reason it's, 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 it's so huge is because there's an issue of prestige. You know that certain kinds of products cost more than others, and some would say they're inflated, and some would say they're better. That's not what this sermon is about. But it's simply that people want to slap labels on something and pretend that it is something that it's not. It's not like that with you and I. Already we are the children of God, and that's really 
true. We are already the children of God. Now, why is this important? Because there's a whole lot of people who think that the whole thing of becoming God's children happens at the end, when the end comes, when Jesus comes back, when we all go to heaven. In fact, one of the things that is being exposed to us as we read through 1 Corinthians together, and I'm sure all of you read 1 Corinthians 6 and looked at all the devotions, is we're being exposed to this idea that the modern Christian world is entirely too fixated on what happens after the Lord comes back, as if the only reason to be a Christian is for eternity. Now, that's a good reason, but there are much more important, there are just as important reasons in our life today. We are already God's children. We, don't, we, we want the benefit of living together, living forever, sorry, benefit of living forever, but that already happens to us. If you are in Christ, you never die, you just step into eternity. We want the benefit of having communion and with God, but already we have communion with God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. God breathes on us on a daily basis. So this is really important for us to understand. We are not just labeled God's children. We're not just, you know, when I, I went to visit, I, I went and visited Boston one time and I went out to whatever the name of that town is where Harvard is and I bought a t-shirt that says Harvard and hope people would think I went to Harvard. Then I went to visit Oxford and I attended some classes there and I bought a t-shirt that says, you know, they sell hundreds of thousands of t-shirts when there's a thousand students in the school because everybody wants them to think. I see somebody who wanders around our office who wears Lakers t-shirts and he wants everybody to think that he's a Laker. And you can look at him and tell that he's at least two feet too short to be a Laker, you know. <laughs> and, and, and that's not what this is all about. We are really his children. Why? Why are we his children? How did it happen? God made a way for you and I through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ accomplished that. He accomplished it entirely on the cross. And on the cross, when we receive the benefit, when we understand, oh yeah, God made that benefit for me. I am already his child. We do that through Jesus. And then the third thing it says is really uh, uh, quite, quite startling. It says that we are unrecognizable to those who don't know God. Now, don't misunderstand. As Christians, it is good and proper and wise for us to try and live lives in such a way that the people in the world will say, wow, you know, these people are different, these people are good, these people will want to follow Jesus. That's true, that's not what this is about. But as followers of Jesus Christ, as his true children, we must be doing things that people in the world will go, that just doesn't make sense. And that's important for us to understand that. We will be unrecognizable to those who do not know God because they don't know why we do certain things. As Christians, the things we do often don't make sense. We don't live for today. Yeah, Fear of missing out. What is, what, what is the other famous one? Carpe diem. We don't carpe diem. We carpe savior. We don't live for today. We don't live for tomorrow. We live for the, the one who who died on the cross and gave his life for us. And the world is not going to be able to understand that. You know, when, when 1 John was being written a little bit later on in, in the time when the scriptures are being written, they already understood that it was going to be tough for them in the world. A persecution had come and different things were happening. And, and most of the Christians, would, when it came time to either deny Jesus and be safe or say that Jesus is Lord and maybe be persecuted, maybe lose their jobs, maybe be exiled, maybe have all their assets stolen, in some cases maybe be put to death, they would choose something and people would go, why did they do that? It's unrecognizable. We do it because we belong to him. They don't know him and they won't know us. And then the next thing it says, and I, I, and I think this is really nice, something better is coming for us. We live for today, but our hope is in what God has prepared for us. It says in that one passage, he has not yet shown us what, it we, what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. There's a promised hope that we will be finally changed. That's such a wonderful thing to think of. When you know the Lord, you long to see him, you long to be in better communication, to, you long to know him, and what we're being told in here is when Jesus comes back, it's not just about us being with really being with him, but the reality that we will be changed by that experience. That experience of being with him 
will change us. Now, John, who's writing this, adds a really additional important thing here. He says, we're going to be changed when that time comes. But in the meantime, what we're not allowed to do is sit back and say, oh, well, I'm going to be changed, so I might as well just relax and enjoy life now. And, and this is the most important thing that we see in that, in that uh, verse 3, where it says in verse 3, all who have this eager expectation. What's the eager expectation? That we will see Jesus face to face. All who have that eager expectation will keep themselves pure. We work on changing ourselves. We work on changing ourselves. We will do our best to be like Jesus Christ. We get an opportunity to know that that work will be completed for us by God. And when this time on earth is over, we're going to be changed forever. But now you and I have this opportunity to be changed in this very world. I, I made a reference. We were talking some, uh, I was talking with some people about some place where Christians were being severely persecuted. And I reminded them of, a, of one of my favorite slogans that says, you don't bury martyrs, you plant them. And in this world, we recognize that in this world, we, we face this conflict, and yet what we have been promised in Jesus Christ is this change. And people who begin this change early, like you and I, have an opportunity to have that change shine in other people's lives. You know, one of my favorite stories in the early days of IES, and I, I'm making a list of the sermons I'm going to preach on. I've got some interesting sermons coming up. Wait until, wait until I announce that I'm going to preach on the things I learned about God by having a tank full of fish. I think that's an interesting sermon. and You'll wait for that one. But one of the things I'm going to preach on is my favorite IES stories. And very, very early on, when IES very first started, we had three life groups, even though, even though the church was only about... Uh, about 80, 90 adults. And uh, we had somebody in the church and, and their family was not happy about them being a part of IES. Their family thought it sounded like some kind of a strange religious group. For one thing, people didn't wear suits and there were a lot of other reasons like that. And then they were explaining to the family and then they said to the family, and we attend a life group gathering, which is like a small group gathering, and we attend at the house of so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so -and, -so. and the parents said, oh, we know them. You're going to their house? They're a part of that church? They said, yeah. And then the, their parents said, we've never seen a person change in their life as much as that person changed when they started going to your church. We're happy that you're going there because that's a really a good thing. Isn't that a great testimony? We know that this is going to happen. We work on changing ourselves. I, I, I'll, never, I'll never be a perfect guy. I'll always have all kinds of things that are failures. One of the things that was brought back to me this week was the issue of learning how to control my temper. I can get to the place where when I get really mad at somebody, I smile. I won't get to the place where I'm not mad on the inside. And, you know, that, 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 but I've got to work on it while I'm working on it. It will be changed someday. But in the meantime, we work. If we have a hope in us, in Jesus Christ, we work to change ourselves, to be more like he is. We're going to close and we're going to close by having you all stand to your feet. We're going to read another translation of this. I'm going to pray a printed benediction and you're going to all walk out of here and say, I have a microphone in my ear. I can turn left or turn right based on somebody who knows the future. And then we'll, I'll have a prayer blessing. And It's a little bit shorter. We, we did love today because you guys know what the 14th was, right? Valentine's Day. All right. And I hope you men, you, I hope you all remembered the lesson from last week. Wood, straw, doesn't work it for Valentine's Day yet. Uh, gold, silver, and precious stones, right? So anyway, but let's read this passage. This is the same passage from the message translation. Uh, the guy who wrote the message is a guy who understands the biblical languages extremely well. He actually taught biblical languages at Ivy League schools. However, he was also a poet and an author. And so he uses some of that poetic language um, it, is, it is very accurate, but it is also very, uh, very beautiful. Let's read together out loud, and then let's, we'll close from that point. I'll be praying for you. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God, and that's who we really are. 
but that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously because it has no idea who he is and what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him. And in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. Let's pray. Now, my brothers and my sisters, as I prepare this, pray this prayer of benediction over you, I pray that you would embrace this passage of Scripture, that you would embrace this thought, and you would allow God's Holy Spirit to give you confidence that you are a child of God, that you would live in that confidence, and that you would be inspired to look at yourself and say, since God is changing me, how do I need to change right now? And that you would, with the work of the Holy Spirit, begin to make those changes that would make you to be more easily and more quickly identified as a son or a daughter of our Savior. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to you and lead you in that direction. And I pray that the love of God the Father the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship and anointing of the Holy Spirit would be with all of you in, G in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases His mercies never come They are new every morning, they're new every morning, great is thy faithfulness, oh Lord, great is thy faithfulness. Bless you all. Have a great week. Hope to see you next week. Thank you so much for joining us this service. And friends, may you be blessed. And we want to invite you to be part of our community, to join us as we go through SOAP. Uh, and SOAP stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. But we are going through the book of 1 Corinthians. And there's actually even daily devotionals that you can access on our social media or on our website. And so please, please, please access that and join us as we look into the book of first corinthians and grow together as a church have a blessed blessed week ahead mm -hmm.